armor or sewing? It's the age-old cosplay debate, but especially in cosplay contests. On the regular old con floor, you can chalk up your excitement for one or the other based on personal preference. And provided you aren't being a d about it, people will understand that it's just your preference. But in contests, cosplayers seem to often wonder which is more impressive looking, which requires more skill to execute, which is more likely to win a contest? Hey, what about which is just better? Hi everyone, my name is Mad Dog. I have a degree in fashion design and a work background in wood fabrication and restoration. And I have some pretty cool cosplay contest wins, including best overall craftsmanship wins for both my work as an armor maker and a sewer. And today, I got a lot to say. I'm gonna be upfront. I'm not interested in making this like a pros cons video or even something like a motivational video where I say, hey, it doesn't matter. Just do what makes you happy. And you may be concerned to hear that if you clicked on this thumbnail looking for one of those two things, but please hear me out because this is actually going to be a much deeper dive on contests and competitors. And I'm really flippin' excited to be finally talking about this because I feel like people who already know what I'm gonna be talking about in this video have a massive advantage over people who don't. So like, let's level the playing fields a little bit, shall we? All right, I literally wrote a whole essay, so I'm gonna start reading it. <laughs> Let's start with a look at how competitions are run, or more specifically, at the category breakdown of the majority of contests. Every competition is going to be different, and you should keep that in mind and read the rules to fully understand how any given contest is run. But a lot of them separate competitors' skill levels into beginner, intermediate, and advanced categories, usually defined per the International Costumers Guild recommendations as novice, journeyman, and masters. These categories are meant to reflect stages in a crafter's journey as they learn new techniques and work to refine them into well-rounded skill sets. And separating these stages allows the audience, competitors, and judges alike to see a wider, more interesting variety of costumes and competitors, and allows everyone to celebrate these stages and achievements within each of them. If we didn't do this in our cosplay competitions, the results would be similar to, for example, having runners of every age compete against one another when racing. You would frequently only see people in their, like, 20s place while everyone else just suffered from various levels of burnout because of the limits of their own body's age. So of course, while there are overall winners of every race, races are often divided into different age groups to celebrate excellence in each. In short, this categorical separation in both running and cosplay makes for a much more fun and interesting and fair contest, when competitors can work towards new levels no matter how they are divided, and can celebrate the best of each category instead of just being presented the overall winner, there's inherently more to be involved in and enjoy, and it also presents a clearer look for everyone at how skills progress over time. If we take these contest categories, novice, journeyman, and masters, and I'm really only going to be looking at the craftsmanship only side of things here today because that's when armor and sewing often come to a head. And the placed awards in each of them, we can actually conveniently see a rather clear outline, maybe even rough timeline, of how skills develop and will be celebrated at contests. Don't take notes just yet though, because this isn't exactly a to scale timeline is possibly a good way to describe it. This is just a rough, theoretical look at how skills progress. In practice, though, skill sets develop quite differently. When it comes to the skill sets of armor making and sewing, my personal learning curves and timelines didn't look anything like this theoretical competition one. Even working really hard to objectively divide up phases of my work that could coincide with the competition categories, they looked something more like this. I started sewing first, so for me specifically, what could be considered the novice level in a competition setting lasted for a really long time. There was a huge amount of time when I was learning to read store-bought patterns, cut things out correctly, and also learning about things like understructure and just how to use a sewing machine and or needle and thread. Then I started learning how to pattern draft on my own, and it was almost like things got worse, like my progress slowed down more. 
The point is, my stuff did not display any level of excellence, even in what would be considered the novice category, for a really long while. And my work was like that until I just happened across this point sometime around senior year of high school where suddenly things clicked for me. The base shapes that make up all patterns started to make sense, and I could figure out how to evolve these shapes into weirder and more interesting ones. I started to feel confident maneuvering the tools involved for sewing, and I fully understood the needs for different types of understructures and finishing techniques instead of just haphazardly using whatever weight interfacing I had that sort of lined up with what random mass-produced pattern suggested. All of this paired with the one-on-one -on -one help that my studies in fashion design offered had me flying through what could be considered journeyman level sewing skills and straight into masters. My armor skill set learning curve and timeline was totally different though. <laughs> By the time I started working with armor materials, I was already a journeyman level sewer and had a lot of pattern drafting knowledge that crossed over and I could use to my advantage instantly in my early armor builds. I'm not saying that my early builds were good, but that knowledge paired with how easy to use I found a lot of armor making tools, like box cutters and heat guns were nothing compared to learning how to use a sewing machine. Let's just say I wasn't considered a novice level armor maker for very long. <laughs> it's been a hefty journey to improve since, as you can see, but at first, I really did progress quite fast. I'm gonna keep my personal timelines up for reference throughout this video to showcase how different timelines can be, but please note that these charts are different for everyone. And I mean that, they really are. Like no two people's learning curves are gonna be exactly the same. And there's a lot of nuance not shown here. For example, something not shown on these charts is how actually long time-wise these are. I've tried to think objectively and give the clearest look I can at my learning curves, but I really have no idea how many hours of my life have been dedicated to learning either skill set, because how do you even define that? Only in hours working with materials directly? What about the time I've spent literally learning and taking notes? What about all the other time I've spent in my own head problem solving whatever I've worked on while never actually working or actively learning? And to add to this example, please remember that these charts are still growing. Like I'm still developing as a craftsman. So your chart for your armor skill set could look more like my sewing chart, but also twice as long in actual time spent. Or you could have something super short and unlike either of these, like maybe have it mostly filled with master level stuff. There are so many options and everyone's will be different. So like I said, while I'm gonna keep my learning curve charts for the development of my armor making and sewing skill sets up here for reference throughout the video, please keep that in mind. Both how your learning curves may differ from mine and how they may differ from everyone else's as well. When it comes down to it, our theoretical timeline of how cosplayers can progress through contests really doesn't mean a lot. And people can progress or just not progress at all in very different ways. If you are actively thinking about what I'm saying rather than, you know, just taking it in and waiting to formulate an opinion until the end, there are fine forms of media consumption, by the way, just like if you, if you happen to be the first. You may find yourself thinking something along the lines of, well, this is interesting to see all laid out like that, how for some people it may take more effort to achieve a certain checkpoint and award on their personal timelines, but why does this actually matter in the grand scheme of cosplay contests? Cosplay contests are not judged on effort that someone's put into their costume or their overall learning curve for a particular skill. They're judged on what people achieve. And you would be right to question me and think just that, because cosplay contests are not judged on effort. As a judge, because sometimes I'm a cosplay contest judge too. I don't care that it may have taken one person longer to learn how to fabricate armor than it did for another to learn how to sew, or the other way around. Because this is exactly right. Cosplay contests aren't judged on time and effort. And actually, while we're here, I just want to say that time is a very poor measure of effort. Like, it's a great stat to know to help you plan future pieces or track over time how your skills have sharpened and sped up but it means literally nothing to anyone else and especially not to judges. That's just my two cents there. Anyway, cosplay contests are judged on if you are good at what you are doing. 
The only time you'll really see effort factoring into an award is for judges' awards, which are considered minor awards and definitely not to be confused with major or placed awards. Judges' awards are genuinely meant to showcase effort and encourage all competitors, yes, even the ones who didn't receive the judges' award, to keep going and keep refining their skills. This is not my saying that judges' awards mean nothing, and if you've received one, it's worthless. Far from it, because it does mean a lot. It means that your efforts were worth pointing out and encouraging. But this is why judges' awards tend to, one, not factor into the category disqualification system, which if you're confused about that, I went over it in my debunking masters video, and two, don't have anything to do with how contests overall are judged and how placed awards and best in show, also sometimes called best overall, are decided. So looking at our little skill timelines, you're only going to hit major award checkpoints if you're actually hitting that checkpoint on your own learning curve timeline, regardless of how long and wild it may be. And of course, you're also only going to place if you're comparatively better than the rest of the people in your category at your contest, who may or may not also be hitting those checkpoints. But let's go back to our road race comparison. You can only receive first, second, or third in your category if you actually cross the finish line first, second, or third in your category. If you come in dead last, it doesn't matter if you trained longer and harder than the placed winners, they're still the winners and you're still dead last. I know it can be frustrating to hear when put simply like that because people seem to intrinsically want to be rewarded for their hard work, but it is what it is. Cosplay contests are not judged on effort. Or, you know, maybe I should make a little verbal asterisk here and say that most cosplay contests are not judged on effort. <laughs> Be sure to read your rules and figure out what yours is judged on before you sign up. They are judged on how successful contestants are and whatever they've attempted to do, and judges will award excellence. However, everyone's learning curve is relevant to this conversation, so let's circle back to it. This is where things... TBH may take a turn for the frustrating as hell if you're a cosplay competitor and haven't put this together yet, but also where things get really, really interesting. Like, I'm actually vibrating with excitement that I'm finally making a video on this. A lot of cosplay contest judging is heavily, heavily affected by how contestants feel about their efforts because contestants get to pick what category they enter. Let's break this down. And I'm gonna try to start simple and work my way into a more nuanced look at this, but I apologize in advance if this just gets very convoluted very fast. <laughs> it may seem at first like it would be easy to look at one's own learning curve and checkpoints and pick out exactly what category to enter under. Regardless of how long it's taken you or how much effort you've put in, if you have a novice skill set, you're gonna wanna enter novice, of course and journeyman will land you in journeyman and masters in masters. But the thing is, when you are learning skills, it's very hard to gauge where you are on your own learning curve timeline until you're quite far along in looking back, even if you have awarded checkpoints to use as a reference. And the majority of competitors do not have master level skill sets and are looking back. When you have these partially completed timelines and very little opportunity for solid critique and feedback, because let's be real, even if you are fortunate enough to have an award or two, you don't necessarily know why. You may not even realize how incomplete your timeline is. I would actually argue that it's very easy to, and a lot of people do, misconstrue their timelines due to how they perceive their own effort and the efforts of others. And when I say argue, I don't even really think that I have to make an argument. It's more so just the truth. I see it all the time, all over the cosplay community, formal contest not even necessarily included. Let's give a hypothetical example. Let's say there's a sewing competitor who has a timeline similar to my sewing timeline, but let's say only half of it. So they're still creating solidly novice level work, no checkpoint in sight. They're trying to figure out what category to enter into in an upcoming contest, and despite having been in contests before, they don't have any major awards, and all they have to really go on is what they can perceive of their own efforts, 
and what they can perceive of the efforts of others. If they're surrounded by others who have skill set development timelines similar to my armor one, so they're seeing people who are putting in what they might perceive to be the same amount of effort as them, but are already creating journeyman level work, they might perceive themselves as being ready to compete at the journeyman level, when in reality they're just not there yet. If this hypothetical contestant enters into the journeyman category, they have unknowingly set themselves up for a competition loss, simply because all they have to go on is perceived effort rather than tangible, rewarded excellence. And this perceived effort can become even more skewed if said contestant doesn't bother to learn about different skill sets and what goes into them. They may, for example, perceive others as putting less work into their craft just because they genuinely don't know the work that goes into it, and then in turn think that their efforts should be rewarded above those other folks because they perceive themselves as having put more work in. What if this hypothetical contestant chooses to enter instead into the master's category because of how they perceive their own efforts? The on-paper outcome at the end of the day would be the same. They literally set themselves up for a loss, just like had they entered into the journeyman category. But the greater their misconceptions about their own work and their fellow competitors' work become, the more confused and frustrated this competitor might become because of the outcome. But move this thought to the back of your mind for a moment because I'm about to add another layer to this contest dilemma. What if said competitor is seeing their peers competing in larger contests and being rewarded for their excellence at the journeyman level, and while they're mistakenly believing that they're deserving of more praise because of their perceived efforts, but just aren't getting that praise, so they go and compete at a smaller contest, thinking for sure they will now, it's a smaller contest with an overall lower standard. And if you're confused about this, this was also talked about in my debunking masters video. And they still don't win anything because they are all in all still creating at the novice level, and even with lower standards, that doesn't necessarily mean novice level work will win them anything. How confused do you think they might be now? How do you think their perceptions may affect their ability to discern the validity or the integrity of the contest? Or any contest? And I'm still gonna have to ask you to hold on to those thoughts of frustration for later. I will come back to them, I swear. But let's get back to the matter at hand. These perceptions, no matter how misconstrued they may be, often affect the contest, period. These perceptions may in fact have the most impact on the outcome of the contest. Really think about this. Had they entered into the novice category, they may have stood a chance at getting a category award. And think about this some more. For all the sus posts floating around the internet complaining about how contests have gone, for how many of those posts do you think every single competitor judged their skill sets accurately and entered into what would be objectively the correct category and had a hand at making the contest fair. Because if even one person misjudges, the contest is less fair for everyone. And to be blunt, there's usually more than one person who misjudges. On paper, these misjudgments may not seem like much. They may seem like, oh well, some people will be upset about the outcome, but the outcome will be the same. But that's not always true. These misjudgments can become quite extreme and have some serious consequences. Let's go back to that what if. What if you have that contestant who perceives themselves to be at the journeyman level but wants to enter maybe a smaller contest so they enter masters hoping that that will be more fair with a smaller pool of applicants, but this contestant is still just solidly in the upper half of the novice level in terms of skill. Now let's consider what if it's not just them who's done this? What if there are multiple people who have misunderstood their place in their skill set timeline? What if it's not just this one contestant, but it is in fact the entire masters category who perceive themselves as masters for this contest, but they're really just novices? How do you judge them? Are you really just gonna hand them the major masters awards? What if you have a category full of journeymen who have placed themselves more accurately and they're really at the journeyman level for this contest? Funny story, you can't just switch the categories around and call it a day. 
What if you have someone who's entering novice for the first time because it's their first ever contest and they genuinely have no idea where their skills fall, but their costume is assuredly the best in show? How do you judge the contest then? Is this hypothetical getting oddly specific? Guys, these aren't what ifs. I have seen this exact scenario play out. I've seen the results and they were wild. All because of how contestants perceived their efforts and chose their categories. Okay, if somehow you're not there yet, just thinking about all this. First of all, you're stronger than me because I am reeling. <laughs> Let's go back to the feelings of frustration because this is it. This is where I see questions pitting armor and sewing against each other the most. I think a lot of questions surrounding armor and sewing in contests, like which one is better, arise because of people's perceptions of learning curves and therefore general misunderstandings in what goes into a skill. And I'm gonna take that one step further and say that I think a lot of the frustrations and sometimes even literal resentment that can bubble up to the surface in contests is also based around this misunderstanding. When people are working to develop a skill, it's easy to only see what goes into that skill and assume that everyone's experiencing the same thing with their other skills and that their learning curves must be similar. But just in my personal learning curve examples where I mentioned that I found heat guns easier to use than a sewing machine, that's not actually the case. Is armor or sewing more impressive looking? Which of the two requires more skill to execute? Which is more likely to win a contest? Which is better? These are all questions developed out of confusion from a lack of understanding. Like if everyone just even somewhat understood different skill sets and focused on progressing their own, they wouldn't be asked in the first place. But not everyone does, and these questions are being asked. And because confusion is all these questions are developed out of, they don't have really great answers. But I'll be darned if I don't try to answer them to drive my point home. Neither armor nor sewing is objectively more impressive looking. It's all subjective and defined by your own tastes. Neither requires more skill to execute, and yet both of them do as well. There are an infinite theoretical number of techniques to learn within each category in places that people can be on their own skill set learning curves. People can be further along on this timeline than others, and you know, a different point on a timeline may require more skill than another, but neither inherently requires more skill, and that's made especially apparent when you're at points relative to one another. Neither is more likely to win a contest. I know saying that is probably going to incite some arguments about bias among judges, and if you are in fact genuinely concerned about bias in a certain contest, you should take that up with the contest coordinators. Not just take to social media or bring it up with the judges who you may literally have concerns about. Take it up with the people who can actually do something about it if they investigate and agree. But when it comes to lower, mid-tier, or even better run contests, there are checks and balances in place to avoid this, and really, neither skill set is favored. And neither armor nor sewing is better than the other. These questions don't matter, but this question more than the rest, because no creative skill is fundamentally more deserving than another. After this video, I better not see any one of you taking time out of your day thinking one might ever be better than another. And if you're still struggling with this concept, still think one skill set might actually be better than another, no matter the reason, I'll give you one word that better change your mind. Elitism. It is elitist to think one skill set is better than another. If you are a cosplay skill set elitist, I would highly encourage you to get your head out of your own. All this to say, any confused questions pitting armor and sewing against each other aren't worth it. They really, truly don't matter. However, any confusion and lack of understanding that forces anyone to this point does matter. And I think that there are things that you can do, and we as a community can do, to help each other and move beyond this. So. What can we do to help this community change for the better? I think the biggest thing everyone in this community can do is just be more informed. General self-awareness developed by learning about your own skill set, not just where you are and where you've been, but what's to come, can greatly reduce the chance for any mishaps in a contest. 
And awareness of skill sets that are different than your own can help too. But I know that's easier said than done when you're focused on your own stuff. So I also want to say not making any assumptions about skill sets that you don't know anything about can be equally as valuable and helpful. And that's really it. That's the biggest thing you can do. Like I genuinely believe that. If you develop your own self-awareness and encourage others to develop their own, a lot of issues in cosplay contests would become quite minimal quite quick. And if you want to take this a step further and really use your own self-awareness to improve your crafting journey and skill sets, start actually learning about critique and then get feedback and critique wherever possible and use it to your advantage. The difference this stuff can make for you and everyone is unbelievable. But now on a not you level, because there's no way we can guarantee that enough people will do this together for it to make an actual difference in contests. I think people should take advantage of feedback forms and contest coordinators' emails more. If you can't guarantee change from the outside in, why not try to change it from the inside out? I think that there are a lot of things that cosplay contests could do better. Like, I could get up on my little soapbox and talk all day about things I want to see changed in contests, and I'm sure, I'm sure one day I will do that. But for now, in regards to this discussion, there are two really important changes that I think contests and contestants could benefit from. The first one is simply said, but hard to enforce, and that's encourage contests to have more judges with more skill sets to balance each other out. I mentioned that there are already checks and balance systems at decent and more than decent contests, but I think we can make things better and more standard. I'd go so far as to recommend encouraging contests to hire a minimum of five judges of varying skill sets for any given contest. That may sound like a lot to some people, but in my experience, one, two, or three judges is just too few for the checks and balances system to work, and four can often leave literal two-on-two -two disagreements, but five is a really solid system. Secondly, and I have a feeling that people aren't gonna like this one as much because it requires more forethought and planning on contestants' behalf. And to be fair on coordinators as well, but let's be real, it's it's gonna be the contestants who are gonna, gonna be loudly annoyed about the extra work. So secondly, I would recommend encouraging contests to accept participants using a curated application system and not just any first-come, first-served system. For a lot of contests, there would probably still be a first-come, first-served element to it because of the large pool of applicants. Like, it would probably go to the first number of applicants to meet all requirements. But there needs to be some more requirements and a real curation process for applications. A lot of higher-tier contests do this already, but I think having an application requiring some photos of previous work, some whip photos of the project you intend to bring to the contest, and a write-up on your cosplay, basic cosplay history, and why you think that you would be a good fit for whatever category you plan on entering would do a lot of good. If contest coordinators or judges could look at these things and possibly contact participants and shift them around categories if necessary, but, you know, overall just to prove who gets to participate in what category, a lot of mishaps could be avoided and we could ensure that contestants were really competing at a certain level of skill. Like I said, I have a feeling people probably aren't gonna like hearing that one as much, but I really do believe this system or a system adjacent to it would make a world of difference moving forward. All this being said, these are not the only possible solutions to problems with contests. They're just ones that I can see looking at things from this perspective. So if you think you have a good idea, put it in the comments and see how people react. Or better yet, reach out to your local contest heads and see if they will consider implementing it. These aren't the only possible solutions. In truth, there are a lot of ways that we could improve contests. And unfortunately, there are harder subjects to discuss within this topic and ways that we should be working to combat them as well that I didn't discuss here today. This video is just one perspective on contests and it was one that I felt that I had the experience to talk about, so I wanted to and I did. But while I personally won't be digging through other cans of worms here at the end of the video, I do want to open a couple of them because they are worth mentioning and you may seriously benefit from thinking about them and discussing them on your own time. The first is, not all contests are based around the novice, journeyman, and master categories. Some contests, especially higher tier ones, actually 100% pit skill sets against each other by dividing categories into things like 
needlework, armor, practical effects, larger than life, etc. And these contests essentially give place towards in each and then crown one contestant and therefore one category, the champion. Considering I just made a video about how no skill set is fundamentally better than another, I don't really like the idea that promotes, and I know a lot of other people who have beef with these categories for that same reason. It's just weird and inconsistent when one year they're praising one category and the next year a different one is best overall. Like, I, I don't know, I don't like it, and I know other people don't either. Not to mention, when you get to these higher tier contests, people are creating builds that use many elements across the categories, so like, it's weird and incorrect to have to pick one category if your build utilizes many. And as things are now, you have to pick one. And you don't even have to know or experience these big contests to see how true and weird this is, because even in smaller contests, there's tons of different competitors who utilize more than one skill set. My first best overall craftsmanship was for the Nightwalker, which was a solidly half armor and half sewn build. I really wish we could do something to make these categories make more sense. And two, for a totally different example, a totally different can of worms, and I'm just gonna say it because it needs to be said, but heads up, this may be really tough for a lot of people to acknowledge. Sewing is extremely undervalued in our global society, whereas fabrication or engineering of any other kind, akin to armor and prop making, is highly valued and considered very skilled. And this societal bias is probably seeping unchecked into our cosplay competition spaces. I know, I said it was gonna be tough to acknowledge, and I meant it. However, it's important to acknowledge that in our society, these fabrication skills are often considered trade crafts, whereas sewing is often reduced to the minimally earning role of stitcher, or just made obsolete because of how fast fashion works. And on that note, in significantly worse cases, but most often, I repeat, most often in our global society, just reduced to sweatshop work. Most sewers are sweatshop workers. That may be weird to hear in this little cosplay echo chamber of ours where there are proportionally a lot of sewers, but that is the actual world that we live in. This is due to how our society has evolved over thousands of years and is very probably continually undervalued even in places that claim to be above this, in large part due to sexism. I am not going to discuss these topics further here, as they're just not the main points of this video essay specifically, and are not points that I feel like I have the knowledge and experience to talk about personally, but they're really important to acknowledge. These and many more points and counterpoints are worth thinking about and worth discussing, and if you realize they're important enough to you, it might be worth it to try to make some different changes than the ones I recommended to the cosplay competition space. They're really worth considering. Armor sewing. <laughs> it's the age-old cosplay debate. But remember, neither is inherently more impressive. Neither is more likely to win a contest. Neither requires more skills to execute. And I only talked about armor and sewing today, but we really need to start acknowledging other types of cosplay as equally important and interesting. <laughs> because no type of cosplay is intrinsically better than any other. And you know, after all is said and done, it may seem like I just tricked you into watching a video dissecting how misunderstandings and assumptions have consequences and we should really all instead be more aware and commit to being better people to each other under the guise of a long debated cosplay query because I did. Was this the video equivalent of a get along shirt? Yes, now get along. <laughs> Well, folks, we're here at the end. This was a beast of a video. So if you made it here, tell me which mystical beast you'd love to have as your familiar in the comments. And be sure to check out my last video where I competed in my first ever cosplay performance contest. Cause I need a break from talking about craftsmanship. Holy hell. It was a really amazing experience. And if you're a fellow cosplay competitor or want to be, or just enjoy learning about and watching cosplay contests, that video is not to be missed. And you know, I got a lot of other cosplay stuff on this channel that's not that as well, but I'm, I'm really excited about that right now. <laughs> anyway, I'm gonna go sleep for the next thousand years, but I will see you next time.